Well, hello there, Slashaholics. This is Lisa Wilcox here from A Nightmare at Elm Street 4 and 5, Alice Johnson, and you are listening to The 80 Slasher Librarian. Ciao. Have fun. Hello, Slashaholics. Be sure to subscribe, click that like button, and click that bell. Also, check out the companion channel, The 80 Slasher Library After Hours, for all the great podcast and original content. Links are in the description below. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. You can find those links in the description below as well, as well as our merch store and the Patreon page. You can support the channel for as low as $2 per month, get some great stuff like free ebooks, free merch, voice a character, and an audiobook narration, and so much more. Tonight's upload is brought to you by our patrons on the Patreon page. That's Tony DeVore. Tyrone Kennard, Nick Velcarve, Jeffrey Quick, Daniel Mackey, David Arnold, Alex Vanover, Krista Campbell, Rob Davey, Jay Gardner, Willow Ravenwood, Lauren Vaught, Kristen Kay, Michael, William Schaefer, Liam Anderson, Bree, Bonanza, Jellybean, Ryan Woodward, Allison Saib, Iron Alexa, Hawaii, Cecilia Spears, Sean Campbell, Catherine McClear, Simonoli, and Carl Eakins. Don't forget to visit the 80 Slasher Librarian merch store. Lots of items, lots of designs. You pick the color and size. And be sure to use promo code TINOFF for 10% off your purchase. Link in the description below. Enjoy tonight's narration. A Nightmare on Elm Street, Part 4, The Dream Master, the novelization of the film by Joseph Locke. Part 1, Kristen. Chapter 1, Kristen's dream began with a particular kind of dread, thick and heavy and oppressive, that she hadn't felt in a long time, almost two years to be exact. It began with a sound, a high-pitched screech, like a piece of chalk scraping over a hard surface. As she walked through the darkness of her sleep, Kristen found that, in fact, the screech was being made by a piece of chalk. It was held in the dainty hand of a little girl hunkered on a clean Elm Street sidewalk beneath the clawing limbs of autumn-stripped trees. She was pressing the chalk to concrete and moving it with great care, the tip of her tongue protruding from the corner of her mouth, her eyes squinting with concentration. She stopped now and then to choose another piece of chalk from a selection of multicolored pieces lined up by her right knee. Her blonde curls danced gently in a sighing breeze. Kristen walked cautiously down the sidewalk in the dim light of a dreamlike dusk, her feet cracking through the brittle leaves shed by the trees. She stopped behind the little girl and stared over her shoulder at the picture she was drawing. It was a house. In fact, a very familiar house. Kristen leaned forward to get a closer look. The house had an almost exaggerated cheerfulness. A picket fence, large windows, a healthy tree in front, fat with green leaves, and a bright sun shining from above. But it was wrong. Kristen knew that house, and there was nothing cheerful about it. 
The house the little girl was drawing was Freddy's house, and there was nothing healthy about it, nothing good. She stood and sucked in her breath sharply, because it was there, Freddy's house facing the street like a death's head. The paint was cracked and curling back like decaying skin, and the boarded windows resembled the sewn-up eyes of a corpse after an autopsy. The house the little girl was drawing was Freddy's house, and there was nothing healthy about it, nothing good. She stood and sucked in her breath sharply because it was there, Freddy's house facing the street like death's head. The paint was cracked and curling back like decaying skin, and the boarded windows resembled the sewn-up eyes of a corpse after an autopsy. The tree in the yard was skeletal, and the pickets of the fence looked like dried bones filed to sharp points. Hello? Kristen looked again at the girl who was staring up with doe-like eyes. Do you... do you live here? Kristen asked. The corners of the girl's mouth turned downward slightly, and she shook her head. Nobody lives here, Kristen then whispered. Where's Freddy? Covering her mouth with tiny fingers, the girl released a giggle that sounded like shattered teeth falling on metal. He's not home. When Kristen looked at the drawing again, the street darkened and her throat constricted. Standing in the window of the chalk house was a figure. It was crudely drawn but unmistakable, Freddy Krueger. A bony hand of lightning clawed the sky and thunder clapped. Drops of rain speckled the sidewalk, and the chalk drawing began to smear. Kristen looked up and trembled beneath silently moving clouds that looked like blood clots. Her chest filled with dread. He's back! God help us, he's back! And she looked down again. The girl was gone. She looked in every direction, her eyes darting through the shadowy light, but she could not find the child. The rain splashed onto the sidewalk, and the chalk drawing melted quickly, its colors blending together into something that resembled spilled blood. There was a sound from the house, a dry creaking that made Kristen spin toward it with a gasp. The front door was opening slowly, as if the house were opening its mouth in a yawn. She felt no surprise. She had expected it. Lightning flashed, illuminating Kristen's surroundings, which were dissolving like the chalk drawing and spilling over the ground, flooding toward her in a rush, surrounding her and pushing her back through the gate toward the house. Groaning with dread, Kristen stumbled up the walk that led to the open door. The slimy substance that chased her toward the house, a mix of dark colors and unidentifiable lumps, slapped against the steps as she lifted her lead-heavy feet onto the porch. It rose higher, as if in pursuit, and she looked briefly into the deadly cold darkness beyond the open door, then stepped inside. There were suddenly voices behind her, the voices of several children singing. Kristen spun around and saw them in the yard. They stood stiffly as the multicolored slime oozed around their thin legs and rose quickly. The thick substance made smacking sounds as it covered the porch and rushed toward the open door. Kristen whimpered, reached out to shut the door, but thought better of it. Whatever lay behind her might be worse than what she was seeing. She turned and looked into the dimly lit house. Tattered curtains fluttered in the wind that blew through broken windows and cobwebs trembled in dark corners. To the left, a staircase led into utter blackness, and the house was filled with the silence of a tomb, until a heavy clattering began at the top of the stairs, and Kristen cried out as an old, rusted tricycle tumbled down the stairs as slow as honey, hitting a step, turning slowly through the air, hitting another step, and turning again. The door slammed shut behind her. No! She cried, spinning around and slapping her hand on the doorknob. She turned it, pulled the door open, and threw herself out of the house and... It was all gone. The front yard, the slime, the children. 
and Kristen found herself, instead, inside the house once again, looking into the dusty decay of a house that had long been abandoned. She turned back, looked through the still open door, and saw the same room on the other side. He's trapped you, she thought. You're on his turf. She moved toward the door, but it slammed shut. When she tried to open it again, the knob would not budge. Be calm, Kristen, she muttered unconvincingly. Just be calm. She turned and looked past the staircase down the long hallway that ended in complete blackness. At the front of the hall and to the right, a door opened slowly with a long, wavery groan. With nowhere else to go, Kristen moved forward and stepped through the door. Old floorboards creaked beneath her feet as she entered the familiar living room. As the wind blew through the trees outside the dirty windows, shadows danced through the cobwebs and over the dusty sheets that covered the furniture. Lightning turned the room in an electric white, illuminating the yellowed old paintings on the walls. Corpse-thin children with distended bellies, swollen lips and eyes deep-set in shadows, playing jacks and marbles and catch in graveyards and garbage dumps. Kristen gaped at the paintings as the lightning flickered, and she clutched her icy chest when she saw the shadow of a hand with long, knife-like fingers sweeping back and forth over the wall. The lightning died with the growl of thunder, leaving Kristen alone in the dark. Her heart strafing her ribcage with machine gun fire. Her lungs seized up and she couldn't draw a breath. When lightning flashed again, Kristen spun around with the scream trapped in her throat to see a bony tree branch scraping the window. Her body rushing with adrenaline, Kristen relaxed and sighed, even smiled a little as she moved toward the window. Thunder hit like an earthquake. The window shattered and snowflakes of glass blew inward. The gust of wind that followed hit Kristen like a cannonball in the pit of her stomach knocking her backward and down a set of metal stairs to a cold cement floor covered with grit and slime. She landed sprawled on her back and lay still a moment, staring up at the dripping pipes that twisted and tangled like one continuous intestine inside a gargantuan body. The boiler room. No, Kristen breathed as she scrambled to her feet and looked around, all her relief gone. She felt as trapped as a caged animal. No, 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 he's, he's not here. He's dead, dead. He's not here. He's dead. Freddy's... She was interrupted by a sound, the teeth grinding scree of metal scraping metal nearby. Freddy's knives. Kristen forced the scream out the way she might force herself to vomit. No! Kincaid! Joey! Help me! Help me! Help! Me! Kincaid's drooping head snapped up and he gasped, startled and disoriented. He was in his bedroom, seated at his desk, where he dozed off while reading a sports magazine. The room was silent except for the soft, wet snoring of Kincaid's mongrel Jason, sleeping fitfully on the bed. Kincaid frowned, looking around slowly and wondering what had awakened him so suddenly. Had his mother called him from down the hall? No, he was sure it hadn't been Mom. If she had called him, she'd still be shouting his name until he answered. No, it had come from from the mirror. He looked at his reflection in the rectangular mirror to his left. A thin film of perspiration glistened on his black skin, making his dark blue t-shirt cling to the hard muscles of his back and shoulders. Uh-uh, he thought. Uh-uh, he thought. Sure wasn't no mirror woke me up, no way. I'm through with that shit. I'm not gonna... The mirror shimmered ever so slightly. Jason woke, got to his feet, and stared at the mirror with his scruffy black ears perked. After a moment, the dog hopped to the floor with a whimper and scurried under the bed. 
the smooth surface of the looking glass began to swirl as if being sucked down a drain, and Kincaid's chair began to tremble beneath his heavy muscular frame. Oh, shit, he whimpered. I'm... I'm asleep! Before he finished the word, Kincaid was sucked out of his chair and across the room into the whirlpool of spinning reflections. He screamed in an uncharacteristically high voice, a voice he'd be ashamed of under normal circumstances, flailing his arms and legs as he fell and fell and fell until he landed with the painlessness of dreams on a hard, wet surface. He blinked, shook his head with a jerk, and looked up into a pair of wide, frightened blue eyes. Aw, oh, shit, Kristen, Kincaid groaned, getting to his feet. Not again, I thought we... She held up a palm. Shh, listen. Rolling his eyes, Kincaid listened a moment. I don't hear nothing. What you... A sound, metal scraping against metal, clinking, scraping. Kincaid's back stiffened. It couldn't be. They were through with all of this, with him. It had ended, and there was no reason for Kristen to pull him into her dreams any more. He tried to bury his fear with anger, but he heard the sound again. Kincaid spun around. Several feet away, about a dozen pulley chains dangled from above in the musty darkness. Drops of moisture clung to their links, and as the chain swayed gently, the rusted hooks at the end of each one clanked and scraped together. Kincaid faced Kristen again, genuinely angry with his friend this time. You are one spook chick, you know that? Her shoulders drooped with relief, and she smiled, started to speak, but froze and gasped. Listen! As footsteps scraped over the grimy concrete, a tall, lanky figure with a long, pale face emerged from the shadows. Kincaid stumbled backward with a dog-like yelp, and Kristen cried out as Joey stepped between them. Trying to cover his fear immediately with cool nonchalance, Kincaid snapped. She pulled you into this, too? Joey, thank God, Kristen gasped. I thought... Thought what? Thought you'd drag us in here? Joey said, irritated. Kincaid felt better knowing he was not alone in his indignation and he and Joey glared at Kristen. It, it's Freddy, she stammered. He's here. Chill out, Kristen, Kincaid snapped. Freddy's dead, buried, consecrated. We won, remember? We watched him fry. He disappeared right in front of us. She shook her head insistently. No, no, he's come back to get us. Joey stepped toward her angrily. No way. Kincaid's right. Fred Krueger is history. Come here. He took her hand and led her to the boiler. It hunkered in a corner like a great metal beast with a fat, rusted belly. Look, he said, jerking the stubborn latch and swinging open the iron door. The boiler's cold. See for yourself. Kristen flinched as Joey positioned her in front of the yawning boiler and lifted her arm to press her hand in the cold iron. She moved her hand over and looked inside cautiously. After a moment, she faced them, her hand still on the boiler. I don't know, guys, she said quietly. I still have the feeling... There was an abrupt sound within the boiler, and something shot out the open door in a blur of white fangs and pink gums, and Kincaid recognized his dog Jason as the growling animal closed its jaws on Kristen's forearm and knocked her to the floor. And Kincaid jerked his head off his desk again and looked around his bedroom. The mirror was still and lifeless. The muffled rumble of the dishwasher came from the kitchen. Kincaid looked over his shoulder at his bed. Jason lay curled on the covers dozing. The dog lifted his head lazily. Blood was smeared on Jason's muzzle. Kincaid whistled softly through his teeth as Joey awoke with a start, his waterbed sloshing beneath him. As he wobbled on the mattress's gentle wakes, Joey clutched the covers and looked around his room quickly, reassuring himself that he was awake. Then he buried his face in his palms and groaned as Kristen threw her covers off and swung her legs over the edge of her bed, her breast heaving with each and every heavy breath.
A throbbing pain crawled up her left arm. She lifted it slowly, dreading what she might see. Blood dribbled from the small puncture marks left by the dog's sharp teeth. Chapter 2 The top was down on Kristen's Volkswagen Rabbit, and the sun warmed her as she slowed to a stop in front of Alice Johnson's house. A bird sang from the branches of an elm as Kristen got out of her car. Down the street, a dog barked and a child laughed a long, giddy laugh. It was a pleasant neighborhood, modest but well-kept and attractive. Just the kind of neighborhood Freddie likes... Kristen wrestled the thought down into the dark basement of her mind, from where it had come. It wasn't even nine o'clock yet, and the day seemed endless because, since she woke up, Kristen had been fighting to keep her mind off of last night's dream. It didn't mean anything, she told herself again and again. It was just a dream, that's all. Maybe I didn't actually pull Kincaid and Joey into it, and maybe I hit my arm on the nightstand when I woke up, and maybe Freddy's really back. Her long-sleeved shirt couldn't hide the slight bulge of gauze wrapped around her left arm. She fingered the bandage as she walked around to the side door of Alice's house and rang the bell. <coughs> Dennis Johnson opened the door, distractedly tying his tie. "'How are you, Mr. Johnson?' Kristen asked, stepping into the kitchen." His only response was a cold and weary sidelong glance as he turned to the kitchen counter and poured a healthy shot of vodka into a glass of tomato juice. Uh-huh, mm, that's nice, Kristen muttered sarcastically. He seldom spoke to her or to anyone and always looked as if he were on the verge of breaking into an angry tirade. Ever since Mrs. Johnson's death after a long fight with cancer almost two years earlier, Mr. Johnson had closed up tighter than a triple lock strong box. His only friend was alcohol, and he wore his hangovers like long pale masks. Hi, Kristen, Alice said, entering the kitchen. Rick will be down in a sec. Mr. Johnson gave his daughter a frowning once over and asked sternly, You going out dressed like that? Alice's red hair fell to her shoulders in flat, lifeless strands, and she wore no makeup. Her poorly matched clothes were baggy and made her look shapeless. Closing her eyes and bracing herself, Alice hugged her books to her breast and asked, "'What's wrong with me this time?' "'Um, I'll just wait outside,' Kristen muttered, embarrassed. "'No, no, don't,' Mr. Johnson drawled sarcastically. "'You're a pretty girl, Kristen. Maybe you can help her.' Shaking his head disgustedly, he turned away as the girls walked out. Kristen ate for Alice. She wasn't a homely girl by any means, but no one besides Kristen and Alice's older brother Rick ever told her that. She never wore makeup or fixed her hair and gave no thought to her clothes, but those things were incidental. All Alice really lacked was confidence and self-respect. Outside, after Mr. Johnson slammed the kitchen door behind them, something clambered overhead and the girls looked up to see Rick crawling out his bedroom window. He hugged the branch of a tree beside the house, shimmied halfway down, and dropped the last three feet to land, smiling in front of Kristen and Alice. He gave Kristen a quick kiss, and she felt a slight tingle rush through her. They had been going steady for about three months now, and a simple kiss still held excitement. Rick was tall and slender, with dark hair moosed into spikes. His face always gave the impression he was about to tell a wicked joke and his eyes never lost their twinkle, even when he was upset. Something wrong with the stairs? Kristen laughed. Rick shook his head, putting his arm around her. Avoid all contact day, actually. What? When Dad's popping aspirins like lifesavers, it's avoid all contact day. As if on cue, the door jerked open and Mr. Johnson glared out, wearing a little tomato juice mustache. What are you waiting for, a limo? Rick bounced up the steps, put his hands on his dad's shoulders, and, mocking Ricky Ricardo, chirped, Okay, honey, I'm off to the club. Then kissed Mr. Johnson on the mouth. 
Sweeping his hand over his lips, Mr. Johnson scowled and slammed the door again. Kristen pulled into the student parking lot of Springwood High School and parked in a slot beside Debbie Stevens' charcoal gray Mazda. Alice Johnson looked on admiringly as Debbie stood. No, Alice thought it's more like a pose beside her car, applying lipstick while looking into a small compact mirror. Hard rock boomed from the speakers of the car. Debbie was not classically attractive. Unlike Kristen, whose blonde hair, blue eyes, and sculpted face made her beauty difficult to hide, but she did a good job of making up for it. A short, tight skirt, black crop top, and black leather jacket showed off her curves while plenty of makeup and full, curly, bronze-tinted hair improved her plain, rather blocky features. Alice had a great deal of respect for Debbie, who came from what Alice suspected Debbie thought was the wrong side of the tracks. She lived on the south side of Springwood, where her father ran a junkyard, and her grossly obese mother sat around eating M&Ms and Doritos all day. So, in an effort to put that behind her, she tended to overcompensate by being a gorgeous social butterfly. Debbie was a little rough around the edges, but Alice liked and admired her for being able to rise above her disadvantaged background. All right, anybody have trig this semester? Debbie called as Kristen killed the ignition. What happened? Rick asked as they got out of the rabbit. I had a conflict. Homework or dynasty? Dynasty won. A sad story, Rick said. Soaps will kill ya. Alice's attention was caught by a familiar red pickup as it pulled into the lot, and she leaned against Kristen's car and watched it park. There was a flutter in her chest as Dan Johnson got out of the truck in tight blue jeans, a black t-shirt, and a green and white letter jacket, his short black hair tossed slightly by the gentle breeze. Debbie took notice, too, cocking a brow and purring. Mm-hmm, we're talking one major league, huh? Alice watched as he slammed the truck door and... And he turned to her and smiled as their eyes met ambling toward her with a boyish grin. As he neared, Alice grinned, tilted her head, and purred exactly as Debbie had. Mm-hmm. You know, you are one major league hunk. Then put a hand on his waist and stepped closer. He chuckled and looked away bashfully. Uh, well, um, th thank you, Alice, but, um... Earth to Alice! Rick sing-songed, waving a hand before her face. Earth to Alice, hey, you spacing again? Embarrassed, she whispered, Rick, please. It was just another daydream, the kind her dad was always complaining about, the kind of thing for which he seemed to despise her so. Alice was relieved when the sputter of Sheila Capecchi's Vespa scooter drew attention from her. All right, Debbie said, I think I see salvation. Sheila was a black girl with light chocolatey skin nerdy thick glasses and hair pulled back in a ponytail. She parked her scooter, got off, and unstrapped the bundle of books and papers from behind the seat. How can you ride that health hazard? Debbie asked. It's no wonder you have asthma. Asthma is an inherited condition. If you read a book every now and then, you might know something. Speaking of books, isn't Trig your favorite? Sheila rolled her eyes. Dynasty again? Girl, do us a favor, get a VCR. From a pocket, she produced an asthma inhaler, slipped it between her lips, and took a few puffs. From a few yards away, Terrence Brady, a cocky black jock with a bulging t-shirt, called, Hey baby, you sucking on the wrong nozzle? Sheila turned away, embarrassed, but Debbie stepped forward, lips curled in a harsh sneer her fist clutching her lunch bag a little harder, and replied, Hey, yo, needle dick, I bet you're the only male on campus suffering from penis envy. Alice laughed as Brady stared in confusion, then walked away. Sheila released a staccato laugh and patted Debbie on the shoulder. All right, girl, I owe you one. 
Really? Debbie asked, reaching into her bag and removing a piece of dried fruit. Well, how about... She stopped, cried out, and dropped the piece of fruit, shuddering as she stepped back. Everyone, including Alice, stepped forward and looked down at the fruit. A large roach skittered over it, Antana quivering this way and that. Oh! Debbie cried, slamming her heel on the insect and twisting her foot again and again. That is so disgusting! She continued twisting her foot and stomped a few times. Hey, hey, Supergirl, Rick chuckled. I think it's dead. Give a bug a break, huh? She stopped, stepped back, her face still twisted in disgust, shuddered again, and then turned away. Alice was surprised. As tough as she was, Debbie was still afraid of a measly little cockroach. Kincaid and Joey met Kristen at her locker, and she could tell by the looks on their faces that last night's dream had not been just any dream. Hi, guys, she said hesitantly. <laughs> Hi, guys, Kincaid snorted. That's all you got to say after last night? Look, I'm telling you, he's coming back, she said. Kincaid relaxed a little, became more sympathetic. Listen, little sister, we know you've got this freako talent for bringing folks into your dreams, but we don't need it anymore. It's time to live like regular folks. Yeah, let it rest, Joey agreed. Sides, who knows? You might stir him back up if you keep going in. Kincaid and I will help. We're still a team, but we all have better things to dream about. You got that right. Signed and sealed, Kincaid added, slapping Joey's palm. She looked at them, wanting to believe, but couldn't. Then what about this? She asked, rolling up her sleeve over the bandage. Kincaid rolled his eyes. That don't mean dick. My dog's just like me. Drag him into your crazy dream and he's going to get wild. On his way down the hall, Rick waved and Kristen and the guys noticed. Here comes your boyfriend, Kincaid chuckled. Can't he give you a good night's sleep? Rick put his arm around Kristen and said, We don't kiss and tell. How about you guys? Kincaid was ready with an angry comeback, but Joey led him away by the arm, and Kristen watched them disappear down the crowded hall. Those guys are kind of, um, spooky, Rick said in her ear. Then you must think I'm a total freak, she laughed. I go back and forth. He kissed her forehead. Kristen looked down the hall again. No, they're okay. We've... we've been through a lot together. Chapter 3 It was the time of day Alice hated the most. Time for Dad to come home. She was standing at the sink washing dishes when she heard his car drive up. It ran over the garbage cans with the clatter. He was drunk again. Rick was in the garage practicing for his martial arts class, and she heard his abrupt movements cease when Dad's car door slammed. First one of the day, Scout's Honor, Dad said apologetically as he came in through the kitchen door. He swayed slightly as he walked. I'm late, I know. Damned contracts. We waited a long time. Alice said quietly. Rick shuffled in and added, But we gave up, as usual. Taking a salad bowl out of the refrigerator, Alice followed her dad into the dining room and began serving dinner. He looked at the salad before him and snapped, You call this vegetation a meal after a ten-hour work day? What the hell am I, rabbit? Christ! Christ, Alice! Can't you try to think just a little more? Heading back into the kitchen, Alice stopped with her back to her dad, and, and, and she faced him angrily, rushed forward, and slapped a hand on the table, speaking through clenched teeth. Yeah, I can think. I can think of how tired I am of watching you drink your life away. I can think of how sick I am of you taking Mama's death out on me. 
He gaped at her in shock, mouth hanging open, and... Dad said, Am I speaking in tongues, Alice? I'm talking to you. Are you awake or what? Dad, don't start, Rick said quietly. Start what? Telling the little daydreamer to wake up? It's long overdue. He got up and went for his coat. Hell with this. Aggravation I don't need. Alice stood at the kitchen sink as long as she could. She listened to him storm out, listened to him drive away. Then the tears came, and she hurried to her room. Kincaid had tried for hours to do his homework, but he couldn't concentrate. He'd finally undressed, put on his sweatpants and t-shirts, and laid down on the bed. Sleep came as easily as concentration, so he grabbed up a handful of darts and tossed them from the bed to the board on the wall across the room, trying hard not to think about Kristen, about her dreams, and, most of all, about him, about Freddy. But it wasn't easy. As the darts thunked against the board, Kincaid's bedroom door creaked open slowly, and he froze. Kincaid sat up on the bed startled, and he saw a shadow on the bedroom floor. It looked like the shadow of a tilted pointy hat on a long head, but it was only Jason. Kincaid sighed and slapped the mattress. Come on, Jason. Come here, boy. Jason hopped onto the bed and curled up between Kincaid's legs. The dog's warmth made him feel a little better, a little safer. He put the darts on the nightstand and leaned his head back on the pillow, closed his eyes, and he jerked awake again. But it was dark now, very dark, and Kincaid reached for the light on the nightstand. His hand struck hard, cold metal. It was all around him, below him, above him, and at each side, and his breathing quickened. His stomach sick with panic as he pounded at the surface above him. It rattled, clanged, and opened. He was in the trunk of a car. Cold night air wafted in as Kincaid sat up in the trunk. Outside, there was only the black night sky above and battered old cars all around, for as far as he could see. Hey, he said, feeling more and more afraid. This ain't my dreamland. He climbed out of the trunk and looked around. He was in an old wrecking yard. Cars were stacked like corpses outside of Auschwitz. Kincaid sucked in a deep breath and cried, Kristen! Kristen, if you're here, I'm going to pound your ass! There was no reply, only a familiar scratching. It was the sound of Jason's paws pattering through dirt. The dog was a few yards away, trotting toward Kincaid. Jason stopped and stared at him. Jason! He was relieved to see a familiar sight, but as he neared the dog, Jason's lip pulled back over sharp teeth, and the dog growled softly. Hey, it's me, Jason! The dog turned away from him and began digging furiously in the dirt, paws pedaling so fast they were nearly a blur. Kincaid drew nearer, but cautiously, no longer trusting his pet. The ground began to collapse beneath Jason's swiping paws, and Kincaid was struck with a sudden feeling of dread. He rushed forward to stop the dog's digging, but Jason spun on him and snapped, growled, and Jason lifted his hind leg to piss. But instead of urine, a stream of fire shot from between the dog's legs, and the hole Jason had dug ignited. Jason bounded away from the fire, yelping, then stopped and turned back, body tensed, ready to run away. Kincaid watched as the flames rose six, seven, ten feet into the air. The ground beneath him began to tremble and crack, and a red glow oozed from the opening, as if hell itself were being revealed. The flames died down as the ground separated, leaving a red glowing pit where there had once been a small hole. Kincaid and Jason moved slowly toward the crevice and looked over the edge. A pile of human bones lay in the flickering glow. A foot or so away from them lay a hat. It was a very familiar hat. The bones quivered, moved, 
Then, with frightening speed, the bones slid together, joints thunking as they were rejoined, separated ribs clattering as they became whole, vertebrae snapping into a column, fingers clicking together, teeth rattling back into their sockets, and Jason barked fearfully, backing up several steps, then turned and ran away as tissue began to form on the bones. Muscles melted together, and veins and arteries appeared in trails over the glistening substance. Then skin, spreading like moisture over a window pane, covered the body completely, as eyes rose from within the skull to fill the empty sockets, and Freddy Krueger smiled up at Kincaid from the pit and sneered. You shouldn't have buried me! I'm not dead! He reached for his hat and dusted it off. Kincaid wasted no time. He turned and ran for the wall of rusty, battered cars, sidling between two of them, then climbing onto another, hiding behind an old crumpled Vega, where he could watch without being seen. Flames shot from the pit, and the earth rumbled again as it closed. When the flames died out, Freddy stood where they had once burned. He lifted his right hand, razor-sharp knives extended from each finger and slid the blades together as he chuckled. They played a deadly note. He walked slowly toward the wall of cars behind which Kincaid had hid. Kincaid closed his eyes a moment and summoned the extraordinary strength that came to him only in dreams, then waited until Freddy was standing in just the right spot beneath him. Kincaid hooked his hands beneath the frame of the Vega and heaved. The car tumbled through the air and landed flat on Freddy. After a moment, Kincaid whooped with joy. Take that, motherfucker! His words echoed through the graveyard of automobiles. He jumped to the ground and grinned at the place where Freddy had stood, waiting for his dream to end. It did not. The headlights of every dead car around him came on, shining with an unnatural brightness. Horns welled like the voices of dying children. Kincaid spun around and around, thinking, It's over, it's over, how come I'm not awake yet? Metal scraped piercingly behind him, and Kincaid spun around to see Freddy emerging from between two cars, dragging his knives along the rusted body as he grinned and rasped, One down, two to go! Kincaid tried to run, but Freddy was faster. The blades glittered in the light of the car's headlights. An instant before they plunged into Kincaid's gut, Freddy pushed them upward as he flashed his rotting teeth. His breath smelled like decayed meat in Kincaid's nostrils. Kincaid felt blood rising in his throat, and it sprayed from his mouth as he gurgled. Kiss my ass. I'll see you in hell. Freddy tilted his head, perversely jovial, and said, Well, when you get there, tell him Freddy sent you! His hellish laugh echoed in Kincaid's ears as his eyes snapped open moments before his death. Jason was hunkered beside him, whining pitifully. Kincaid clutched his stomach, expecting to find blood, but there was nothing. The dog licked Kincaid's cheek as he tried to call Kristen's name. He died before he could. <laughs> At least you guys don't complain about your food, Alice muttered as she sprinkled fish food into the small aquarium in her room. Capping the food again, she went to her vanity. Its large mirror was almost completely obscured by photographs taped to the glass, some overlapping others, some covered entirely. They were pictures of Sheila and Debbie, Kristen and Rick, Rick and herself, but her favorites were the pictures of Alice, Rick, and their mother together. There were a lot of those. She'd been so pretty before she got sick, before the cancer began chewing up her insides. Somewhere on the mirror were a couple of pictures of her dad, but she didn't look for them. They were probably covered up anyway. Sort of defeats the purpose, doesn't it? Rick asked, coming into the room. What? The mirror. You can't see yourself in it. That's the point. I don't want to. She went to her bed and sat on the edge. You know, if Mom were still alive, Dad wouldn't treat us like he does. 
Nah, come on, his mind is doing the freestyle in Cuervo Gold. He doesn't mean it. You know, sometimes I really want to be what he wants, and other times I just don't care. The problem is, when I look in the mirror, I'm never what I want to be. That's because you can't see yourself, like I said. You know, if you took a good look, you might surprise yourself. You've just got to chase a few dreams. Find out what you want to be, then go for it. She shook her head distractedly. It's all in your head. What? Your mind pictures you doing something and your body reacts. Like this. He stood straight, kicked a leg high into the air while jerking back his elbows and shouted, Fight! See? Like that. Come on, you try it. Me, I can't do that. Sure you can. He pulled her from the bed and stood her in the center of the room. Okay, like this. He repeated the kick. Now, go ahead. She gave it a half-hearted try and nearly fell over. Rick gave her a polite Japanese bow and said, Ah, Alison, you must have balance. Now, try again. With the next kick, her shoe flew across the room and plopped into the aquarium. Alice laughed and buried her face in Rick's chest. Well, you've got pretty good aim, he chuckled. He put his arms around her and gave her a squeeze. So you're not a martial arts expert. So what? You've just got to keep shopping around. And when you find what you want to be, give it your all, okay? That's easy for you to say. You've got a personality. So do you, he said, kissing her forehead. You're the only one who doesn't know it yet. Joey lay on his waterbed, idly sloshing the mattress with his foot. MTV was on, the volume low, but Joey ignored it in favor of the poster on the wall across the room. It was a picture of a beautiful blonde stretched out on a tiger skin rug. She wore a yellow bikini that concealed little, and she looked directly at Joey with promise and invitation. Mm -hmm. He breathed, locking his hands behind his head and allowing himself to relax. He even began to doze a little as he stared at the poster, wishing, imagining, dreaming. He thought of how she might feel and smell, how she might taste, and he had a nearly perfect image of her standing beside his bed when a jarring movement startled him from his fantasy and made him sit up. The waterbed was sloshing furiously, almost as if something were inside the mattress. Joey turned, clutched the bottom sheet, and pulled it away from the mattress, looked through the transparent vinyl, and gasped whenever he saw a figure swimming in the water beneath him, backed by a soft glow. It was a woman. A naked woman, and she looked like... No, Joey thought. Couldn't be, it couldn't be. He looked up at the poster. The girl was gone. All that was left on the tiger skin was the yellow bikini lying in a tiny heap. Inside the mattress, the girl moved gracefully, her blonde hair flowing around her head liquidly, her small, firm breast pressed flat to the vinyl as her lips silently formed his name. Joey! Joey knew he was dreaming. The poster girl had come to him in his dreams before, but she'd never been inside his bed. What a great bed! Joey laughed, getting on his hands and knees, pressing a palm to one breast. He felt it beneath the vinyl, but for only a moment, and then the girl began to sink, fading into the soft glow that came from deep within the water. Wait, come back, he called, but only water slurped quietly inside the mattress. Joey sighed and started to put the sheet back up when he saw slight movement deep in the water again. Something was nearing the surface, swimming upward quickly, and a hand reached toward Joey. But it wasn't just any hand, and it wasn't her hand, because there were knives extending from the fingers, coming up faster and faster until they sliced cleanly through the vinyl, and Freddy rose out of the water with a great splash, wrapping his arm around Joey's neck smoothly and holding him close in a deadly embrace. Joey felt as if the bottom of his stomach had fallen out as he struggled helplessly. Defeat overwhelmed him, and he cried out in a childlike voice, How's this for a wet dream, Joey? Freddy sneered, his laughter filling the room as Joey continued to fight. 
and he screamed for help. He screamed for Kristen. Two down, one to go! Joey screamed once more in vain until the water filled his mouth as Freddy pulled Joey into the water and they went down farther and farther until Joey's lungs burned for breath and his skull felt as if it were being crushed. And then there was nothing, not even dreams. When Joey's mom came into his room to say goodnight, she clicked her tongue when she saw the television was still playing that wretched MTV. She couldn't understand the attraction. This garbage, she muttered, turning it off. She turned to his bed. The covers were in a heap. Joey, she said quietly, come on, give your old ma a kiss. She went to the bed and carefully pulled the covers back and saw that the bottom sheet was gone. So was Joey. She whipped the sheets back and her screams sounded through the entire house as she stared at her son's dead body inside the waterbed mattress. <coughs> Chapter 4 On a bench in front of the school the next morning, Kristen's hand trembled as she lit a cigarette. Sleep had been scarce the night before, and she'd had too much coffee before coming to school. The night had been filled with voices, Kincaid's and Joey's calling her name. She'd been looking for the boys since she'd arrived that morning but hadn't found them, and her stomach was tangled in an anxious knot. When a hand touched her shoulder, Kristen jerked around to find Alice. There you are, Alice said. Where are you this morning? Rick's been looking all over for you. Kristen clutched Alice's arm. Have you seen Kincaid or Joey? I can't find them anywhere. I haven't seen them, Alice sat beside her. I called them, but no one answered, not even their parents. When Alice frowned with concern, Kristen tried to calm herself. We have matching luggage, she chuckled. Huh? The bags under your eyes, I've got them too, see? Nightmares? Alice nodded. God, I hate dreaming. I love to dream, Alice said. I just hate the ones about my dad. You could do a lot worse, believe me, Kristen stamped out her cigarette. How do you handle your dreams? Alice brightened. My mom taught me when I was little. Ever heard of the Dream Master? Sounds like a game show host. No, really. It was like a teddy bear or something. The guardian of good dreams gave me confidence. Do you know his phone number? Alice laughed. Sorry? There was a rhyme, I think, but I've forgotten it. So, what do you do now? Now I just really try hard to dream of something fun. Remember, Kristen, you're in control. You're your own dream master. Kristen was silent a moment. I used to bring people into my dreams. You what? Whenever I had nightmares, I'd bring people in to help me. She could tell Alice was skeptical. Never mind, it's kind of complicated. The bell rang through the campus and Kristen stood, forced to smile. Well, we better go before your brother starts a search party. Ken, Kate, and Joey had Mr. Bryson's English class with Kristen, and as she walked down the hall with Rick and Alice, she prayed they would be there. If they weren't, well, she didn't know what she would do. They were late, and the class was already full, and when they walked in, everyone turned to see who was tardy. Kristen scanned the room quickly and gasped when she saw that Ken, Kate's and Joey's desk were empty. Kristen's heart froze. She stumbled backward and tried to find her voice. Kincaid! Joey! My God, he got them! Oh God! Oh God, he got them! Rick grabbed her arm and hissed. Kristen, what's the matter? She faced him and sputtered. They're... They're gone! He got them! My G God, he got them! He killed them! Alice stepped toward her, and Rick tried to pull Kristen toward him. 
She spun away and threw herself toward the open door but tripped on Rick's foot, and she felt herself falling, saw the floor sweeping up to meet her, saw the door jam an instant before her skull cracked against it, and... The light around her began to fade and the voices of her classmates sounded more and more distant, until Kristen opened her eyes and looked up at the glaring fluorescent lights of the infirmary. The school nurse smiled down at her. The woman's face was square and homely, her dark hair in short curls, her watery brown eyes peered through owlish glasses, and she wore too much perfume. Are you feeling better now? She asked. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. What happened? You had quite a nasty bump. The nurse's voice was soft and frizzy. Kristen tried hard to focus her senses. When she remembered what had happened just before she bumped her head, she tried to sit up and blurted, I gotta get out of here. The nurse pushed her down again. You just stay put. You need your rest. No, no, Kristen hissed urgently. You don't get it. He's after me. Don't worry, honey, everything's fine. The nurse smiled again, showing her small, ugly teeth and turning away, hunching over a small chrome table. She fumbled for a moment with something Kristen couldn't see. Kristen tried to relax, but the light was so bright and the room was so clean and neat and white. With a jolt, she felt that something was suddenly very wrong and looked at the nurse suspiciously. The woman's white uniform was stretched tight over her back and began to spread with bright red stains. Kristen frowned, sat up and watched as the stains grew larger, almost as if, as if something were oozing through the material from underneath, something like blood. The nurse spun around quickly and held up an enormous syringe, and Kristen looked at her face to see that she was Freddy. He laughed deep in his chest and sneered, Just lie back! I need to draw a little blood! Kristen screamed as she rolled off the examination table, and her eyes snapped open as she lay on the examination table. The school nurse smiled down at her, peering through owlish glasses, and said, Feeling better now? Kristen took a deep breath and let relief wash through her. This was the real school nurse. She was homely too, but she wasn't Freddy. Chapter 5 Later that afternoon at the Craven Inn, Alice was just ending her shift as a waitress and was standing behind the register getting her things together when Dan walked in. She felt her throat constrict when he walked toward her smiling. Hi, he said. Is uh, Rick around? Um, no. Rick stayed late at school. C Kristen wasn't feeling well. Ah, are you his sister? That's you, right? Uh huh, a Alice. I'm uh, Dan. Rick and I were supposed to go uh, work out later. If he comes in, I'll be over there. He joined a couple of other guys at a corner table, and Debbie hurried over to take his order. Alice watched him dreamily for a while until Sheila walked in and stepped in front of her, laughing. Honk alert, honk alert. Alice rolled her eyes and got her purse. Look, I can't wait around for you today. Sheila said. I've got to get to the library before it closes. Killer physics test tomorrow. I know, and I'm not ready. Debbie came to the counter, scribbling on her order pad. He is so cute, she whispered. I wonder where he works out. Girl, Sheila said, you know there is life after exercise. Someday you'll learn to appreciate my motto. And what's that? Mind over matter. She whispered dramatically, and then laughed. 
The bell over the door clanged as Rick hurried in with Kristen, shuffling behind him. She looked as if she'd been crying. Come on, Alice, Rick said urgently. We've got to get out of here. What's going on? He whispered. Kincaid and Joey died last night. What? How? Goose flesh shriveled the back of Alice's neck when she remembered how concerned Kristen had been about them. Did she know something? Alice turned to Kristen and took her arm as Rick hurried over to Dan's table. What happened? Look, Kristen whispered. You can hear all kinds of stories, but I know what really happened. She began to cry softly. How could have I... How could have I... How could I have let him get them after all we'd been through? We were a team. We were in it together. I'm going to get that son of a bitch. Who? Kristen shook her head evasively and called. Come on, Rick. Let's go. Alice got her purse, tossing a wave to Debbie and Sheila, who looked puzzled. I'll fill you in later, Alice assured them, and followed Rick and Kristen out, surprised to see Dan coming after her. Mind if I come? He asked, looking a bit confused. Alice shrugged bashfully, and they got into Rick's car. Dan sat in the back seat with her as Rick pulled away from the diner, and then Alice asked, Will somebody please tell me what's going on? Kristen took a deep breath as if composing herself and asked, Have you ever heard of Fred Krueger? Freddy Krueger? What, that creaky old town legend? Dan laughed. It's not a legend. It's a true story. He was a child molester, a child killer. He lived on Elm Street, killed a lot of kids in an old abandoned boiler room. He used to torture them. Then he'd cut them up with a glove he made out of metal with long blades on the fingers. After he was finally caught, he was acquitted on a technicality. The parents on Elm Street weren't too happy about that. They didn't like the idea of a child killer living on the block, you know? So they all agreed to take care of him themselves. One night, they burned him alive, but he wasn't gone. She wiped a few stray tears and sniffled before continuing. Freddy came back in the nightmares of his killer's children, the Elm Street children that he'd missed. And then, when he killed them in their dreams, they died in their sleep. Dan cleared his throat and said hesitantly, Well, um, look, you know, everybody has nightmares, but I... She looked at him over her shoulder. You don't know what nightmares are. In these dreams, you... You play by Freddy's rules. Wake up or die. Freddy doesn't like to let anyone get away. We did once, Kincaid and Joey and I. That's why Freddy's back. And that... She pointed out the window as Rick slowed to a stop in front of a large, run-down house with pilling paint and boarded windows. That is his house. They all got out of the car and looked at the house from the sidewalk. Creepy house, Dan said. It's not just any house, Kristen replied, visibly shaken. It's his home. That's where Kincaid and Joey and I fought him. There were others, too. All people I'd met in, well, a place I stayed in once. Alice had heard rumors that Kristen stayed in a mental hospital for a while a couple years back. She never knew if it was true and thought it impolite to ask. Maybe she had. Maybe that's the place she was referring to. And maybe, just maybe, it was about time for her to go back for a while. But then again, maybe not. We were the only ones to get out alive, Kristen said. We watched him burn. We thought he was gone, but... But Freddy never seems to go away, not for good, and now he's back. He got them, and I'm next. He's coming for me next. Rick put his arm around her and gave her a squeeze. Come on, babe. Let go of it. You're safe. He kissed her cheek and said, Dan and I are going to go look around a little. They went up the walk and wandered around the house. Now I lay me down to sleep, Alice whispered. What? The Dream Master. I think I remember the rhyme. Now I lay me down to sleep, the master of dreams my soul to keep. Ah, uh, I'm sorry I forget the rest, but it's... It's like the prayer, you know? That's okay, because I don't have a prayer. 
A horn honked, and they turned to see Kristen's mother pulling up to the curb. She rolled down the window and shouted, Kristen, get the hell away from that house now! On delay! Rick hurried to Kristen's side and whispered, You don't have to go if you don't want to. I'll stay with you. No, no, I should. She turned and forced a smile for Alice. The worry knitting her brow made her look older, haggard. Alice felt a pang of pity for her friend and leaned forward to whisper in her ear. What you said about pulling people into your dreams. Well, if you ever need help, think of me. I'll come. There were tears in Kristen's eyes as she walked away. Rick watched her drive away and then said, Well, what do you say we split? They started for Rick's car when something on the ground caught Alice's eye. It was a colorful chalk drawing of the Kruger house obviously drawn by a child. It looked faded, a little smeared, but the colors were still surprisingly bright. Come on, Alice, let's go, Rick called. She walked a few steps and then stopped. She'd seen something in the window of the chalk house, a figure. She turned to look again, but the drawing was gone. The sidewalk was clean. Daydreaming again, she thought, as she got into the car. Chapter 6 Kristen was not hungry, but to make dinner even more unbearable, her mother was staring at her from across the dining room table. She nibbled a bit of chicken, but mostly just prodded her food with her fork, barely able to keep her eyes open. She felt exhausted since she got home. Is something the matter with the food? Mother asked. Kristen said nothing for a moment, then made no attempt to hide her mood. Well, I'll tell you, Mom, when two of your friends die the same day, you let me know what it does to your appetite. She relaxed a little and sighed. Kristen sipped her lemonade. It tasted a little bitter, but it was cold and felt good going down. You're just tired, Kristen. Don't think I haven't noticed that you're not sleeping. That's got to stop, you know. She couldn't take any more. Well, I'm sorry if I'm not very good company. Kristen said, standing, but the room tilted. It swayed, and she fell back into her chair, holding her head. Her eyes felt heavy, swollen, and her tongue seemed thick. She wanted to sleep, but couldn't. She wouldn't. She straightened up in her chair, lifted her glass of lemonade to take another drink, and it hit her. The lemonade's bitterness, her sudden drowsiness. Oh, God! She said, What did you do? She turned to her mother, who averted her eyes and shouted again, What? What did you do? It'll ease your anxiety. What? What? You need to sleep, Kristen. She dropped the glass. It shattered and lemonade splashed everywhere as Kristen reached for her mother's purse on the corner of the table. Her mother grabbed for it, but Kristen was faster. She turned it over and spilled its contents in a heap. A bottle of sleeping pills popped open, and they skittered over the tabletop. Oh, oh my God! Kristen screamed, stumbling away from the table. I'm sorry, honey, but... Sorry! Kristen faced her, leaning weakly against the wall. Sorry that you and your tennis pals torched this pervert so he could chase me in my dreams? In case you haven't noticed, mother, it's his fucking banquet, and I'm the last course. Kristen, she snapped, pounding the table. We went over this in therapy. You dealt with all of this in the hospital. It's over. Mother, you've just murdered me. Take that to your fucking therapy. Ignoring her mother's shouts, Kristen staggered up the stairs, mumbling, hissing to herself. No. It can't end like this. I won't let it. No. In her room, she locked the door and leaned against it, remembering what Alice had said. Think of me. I'll come. Think of me. I'll come. Kristen stumbled toward the telephone on the nightstand, but fell with her arms outstretched, just a few feet short. The pills were pulling her under like a deadly riptide, sucking her away from a safe white beach, dragging her into an ocean 
of unconsciousness. Mustering all of her strength, she called, Alice! Alice! But the name was only a breath. She rolled on her back, murmuring, Alice! Alice! Got a dream! Fun! Dream someplace fun! Someplace fun! Her leaden eyes finally closed and she slipped into a heavy blackness that was interrupted only by the sound of water lapping against a shore. Kristen opened her eyes and looked up at a bright blue sky. Sitting up, she found that she was wearing a bathing suit and lying on a towel. A breeze whispered through palm trees all around her, and sunlight glimmered on a broad body of water. A few yards away, a little girl knelt on the shore, building a sandcastle. It was large and detailed, rather elaborate for a girl so small. The girl smiled and waved. Kristen waved back and laid back on her towel, but she frowned. It wasn't a sandcastle, it was a house. It was his house. Kristen set up quickly, but the little girl was gone. She looked all around, but she was alone on the beach. Only the castle, house, Kristen corrected herself, remained on the shore, except something in the water caught Kristen's attention. A flash of light, a ripple of movement. She set up straighter and squinted, following the small moving object. It almost looked like a, yes, a shark's fin. Leaning forward, Kristen saw it glint again, like metal, as it cut through the water, zigzagging a few times, and then it took a sharp turn and increased its speed, heading straight for the beach. As it drew near, it became more detailed, and Kristen could see that it was made of metal, and it was not a shark's fin. Seconds before it reached the beach, Kristen realized with the bone-deep chill that the object was four razor-sharp blades in ascending height, slicing through the water toward her. Closer, closer, until they hit the shore and kicked up a burst of sand as they cut through the ground with ease, heading straight for the sandcastle, straight for Kristen, until it hit the sand house and an explosion sent a cloud of sand into the air and sent Kristen scrambling backward, trying to get to her feet but she froze when she saw a figure in the slowly clearing mist of scattered sand. Freddy. She was paralyzed with fear as he walked toward her, his grin filled with promises of pain and torture. When she was finally able to stand, the sand beneath her weakened suddenly, and her bare feet sank into the ground. She was buried to her knees by the time she looked down at the undulating ground beneath her. She was not simply sinking. The sand was sucking her down, and Freddy was coming closer. No! Kristen shouted, struggling uselessly as she was sucked deeper. As the sand rose to her waist, her breasts, Freddy stood beside her, blanketing her with his shadow and grinned. He lifted his foot, held it above her, and then lowered it slowly until it was touching the top of her head. He pushed and Kristen fell through the sand into nothingness, bracing herself for a fall. When nothing happened, she opened her eyes, found herself on her hands and knees in a dimly lighted room, an upside-down room. No, she thought, feeling dizzy, the room isn't upside down, I'm on the ceiling. She defied gravity, clinging to the ceiling of Freddy's living room like a fly. Quickly gaining her bearings, Kristen crawled on all fours, slowly and carefully across the ceiling to the wall. Expecting to fall, she continued down the wall, cutting diagonally towards a door. She reached down, turned the knob, and threw herself through the doorway, and landed in the boiler room. Please, God, no! She screamed. The room glowed a fiery red, and steam hissed between the pipes. She stood and looked around her and stiffened when she saw Freddy standing in front of the open boiler across from her. Deadly flames danced inside the boiler behind him. He grinned and chuckled and swiped the air with his razors. Rage bubbled inside Kristen, and she cried defiantly. We beat you before! 
Summoning the power that had saved her in her dreams past, she rushed toward him, jumped into the air, flipped smoothly and slammed her feet into his chest, and then rolled away. Freddy sprawled to the floor but got up quickly, his grin replaced by an angry scowl. But you're all alone now, he growled, advancing toward her. The last Elm Street brat. Why don't you call in one of your friends? Never, she shouted, determined not to be responsible for any more death. <laughs> Moving closer, Freddy screeched his blades down a pipe and sneered. Why don't you reach out and touch someone? Closer still. Don't you want some help, Kristen? Yes, she thought. I don't want to be alone. I don't... No! She cried, backing away from him. I won't do it! Think of me. I'll come, Alice had said. Think of me. I'll come. No! No! She said again as Freddy drew close enough for her to see the individual burn scars on his ravaged face and the rust or dried blood on his blades. You know you want to, Kristen, he hissed her back pressed against a wall of pipes. I know you want to! She could smell his breath, and the blades were reaching toward her face, her throat, and she screamed, Alice! There was a clatter above them, and Alice's limp body fell, landing on top of Freddy and flattening him to the floor. Alice immediately began crawling, her face wide with panic and confusion. Kristen clutched Alice's arms and dragged her away from Freddy and helped her to her feet. I'm sorry, Kristen shouted. Go back, get out, she slapped her confused friend hard in the face. Wake up and get out of here. Alice looked around her, eyes widening in horror until she saw Freddy. She looked like she wanted to scream, but was too scared. He stood a few yards away and laughed. How sweet! Fresh meat! <laughs> he rushed forward, reaching for Alice, but Kristen stepped between them, shouting, Leave her alone! And Freddy closed his fist around Kristen's shirt lifted her from the floor, and threw her into the air. She tossed head over heels, arms and legs flailing, and before she could scream, Kristen landed in the flaming boiler. Her skin began to hiss immediately, glistening in the intense heat, then turning a charcoal black as it bubbled. Her hair crackled as it burned, and her face felt as if it were melting from her skull as she looked out of the flames and screamed helplessly at Freddy as he ripped open his shirt to reveal his mangled flesh beneath and the tortured faces of his young victims, their mouths yawning in silent screams, eyes bulging in pain, and Freddy shouted into the fire, Now, you're one of my children! He spun around and faced Alice, who released a shrill scream when she saw the writhing faces beneath his shirt. He moved toward her, and Kristen clung to her last remaining thoughts as her body disintegrated rapidly. She was determined to keep Freddy from Alice, and calling upon her dream strength, extended a charred arm and shrieked as a bolt of electric blue energy shot from her fist and hit Freddy square in the back, making him dance like a marionette for a moment. But the damage was short-lived. Freddy arched his back and seemed to swell, to pulsate as if feeding on the energy. Then, releasing an echoing laugh, he advanced on Alice, who backed away in paralyzed terror. Her voice a dying gurgle, Kristen screamed, Alice, you'll need my power! and shot another bolt from the furnace aimed straight at Alice. It splashed against her chest in a flurry of sparks, and Alice lost her breath for a moment, clenched her eyes shut and stiffened, feeling as if she were being electrocuted. The soothing blue energy coursed through her body like a revitalizing drug, and Alice opened her eyes as Kristen's smoldering face took shape in Freddy's chest emerging among the other faces of lost victims. 
her skin bubbling, mouth gaping. Freddy was less than three feet away when he lifted his arms and swung the deadly blades through the air. And Alice sat up in bed screaming, clutching the sweat-soaked sheets. For a moment, she could still feel the sizzling energy coursing through her body, and her throat was sore from breathing smoke. As she regained her bearings, breast heaving, she noticed something unfamiliar on her mirror across the room. A postcard was tucked beneath the mirror's frame. She got out of bed, crossed the room, and plucked the card from the frame, and gasped. In the picture, Freddy grinned as he held a terrified Kristen in his arms. Alice read the words, written in blocky red letters aloud. Greetings from hell! Wish you were here! The card began to blacken and shrivel, and flames licked the paper in Alice's hand. She dropped it, gasping, and it disintegrated before it hit the floor. Alice looked at the mass of pictures on her mirror and saw her eyes reflected in the small, rectangular space left by the postcard. Her eyes were different, more intense somehow. They had changed. Rick burst into the room and gasped, Alice, are you okay? I heard you. She faced him and cried. We've got to get to Kristen's house. They ran most of the way and saw the smoke half a block away. It billowed from Kristen's bedroom window. Rick kicked in the living room's plate glass window and tore aside the curtains. Alice followed him inside. As they started up the stairs, they heard Mrs. Parker screaming in the hall. They found her standing in the smoky doorway of Kristen's room. Rick pulled her away and Alice stepped up to the door. It was too late. The room was gone. Flames climbed the walls and poured across the ceiling. All she could see of Kristen was a blackened arm that, in an instant, was swallowed by the fire. Part 2, Alice, Chapter 7 Three days later, when Alice got home from the funeral, she went into the family room and fished through the row of videotapes in the cabinet until she found the one she wanted. She slipped it into the VCR, turned on the television, and watched as Kristen appeared on the screen, laughing, as Rick held her down on a patch of grass and tickled her. Stop it! Stop! Kristen shrieked. The images and voices that followed... Kristen and Rick playing, Debbie razzing Sheila about studying so much, Sheila razzing Debbie about working out so much, made Alice feel better. Returning from the funeral, she'd been overwhelmed by a need to see Kristen, hear her, be close to her. Alice heard Rick come into the family room, but did not look up. She couldn't take her eyes from the screen, as if she were drawn to Kristen's image. Alice... Rick whispered, sitting beside her on the sofa. What are you doing? I don't know, she shrugged. I guess it, it makes me feel better. She smiled at the screen. You made her so happy then, Rick, remember? Yeah. <sighs> he sighed heavily. Why didn't I stay with her that night? It wouldn't have made a difference. Sure it would have. Alice faced him. No, it wouldn't have. I saw it happen in my dream, Rick. There was this man, this horrible man, and... Oh, who? Freddy? He held up his hand. Look, I've had enough of Freddy, okay? I heard it all from Kristen, and I don't want to hear it anymore. So just stop it. He turned away from her. Alice didn't stop. She grabbed his shoulder and pulled him back around, saying urgently, I could smell the smoke, Rick. I could feel the heat from the fire. I watched her burn. He covered his face with his hands and growled. Mm, stop it. Just stop. Kristen wasn't crazy, and neither are you. Alice, you're not crazy, so why are you acting this way? Pulling his hands away, Alice saw that he was about to cry. Why, Alice, he whispered. I... 
I don't know, Rick. Really, I, I just feel... So, she tried to choose her words carefully. He was already beginning to think she might be losing it, and she didn't want that. She needed his help. I feel so different. Something happened in the dream, I think. I, I can't think of anything but Kristen, which is normal, I guess, but this is different. I changed in my dream. She did something to me. Now it's like part of her is with me all the time, inside me. I think I even look different, don't I? Don't you think so? He looked at her silently, shaking his head. Rick? He got up and left the room. The next day, studying her reflection in the girl's restroom mirror, Alice was certain she had changed. Her face was more defined. Perhaps her features seemed to stand out more and her eyes seemed brighter, in spite of the fact that she'd been up all night and felt tired enough to sleep standing up. Someone had left a pack of Marlboros by the sink, and Alice shook one out, took matches from her purse, and lit it up, taking a puff. She burst into a fit of coughs and stared at the burning cigarette, sputtering. I... I don't smoke. But Kristen did, she thought, dropping the cigarette in the sink. Kristen, she whispered. What did you do to me? Sheila came in and stood at the faucet beside Alice and splashed cold water on her face. I'm dead on my feet, she said exhaustedly as she dried off with the paper towel. We have matching luggage, Alice said, startling herself. Those were Kristen's words. What? You've been up all night? That's obvious, huh? Alice brightened with hope. Then you saw him too? Saw who? I didn't see anybody. I was up all night cramming for this physics test, and I was putting this little baby together. She opened her book bag and removed a gadget that looked like an electric shaver with a joy buzzer on the end. You know how Debbie's afraid of bugs? Well, I made this for her. Ultra-high sound waves. Makes them run, screaming their antenna off. She frowned at Alice and asked, Hey, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. She knew she didn't sound too convincing. Well, good luck on the test, Sheila said, gathering her things. See you in class. Once the physics test had begun, Mrs. Geary's classroom became silent as a tomb. It was the kind of silence that invited sleep, and Alice's vision blurred with exhaustion. Sheila was seated in front of her and already busy writing answers. Alice's eyes grew heavy, and her head bowed as she began to doze, the room's silence and warmth easing her into a comfortable sleep, until Sheila gasped and Alice snapped alert, leaning forward in her desk to see what was wrong. Sheila was sitting stiffly, staring at her test paper with her pen poised to write, as the pre-printed equations danced over the page like tiny acrobats, tumbling over one another, spinning and twirling. The numbers stopped, and letters were quickly scrawled on the paper with an invisible pen. Learning is fun with Freddy! I'm asleep, Alice thought. I gotta wake up. Wake up. I gotta... Alice heard something dripping and looked over Sheila's shoulder, again to see that blood was dripping from the point of Sheila's pen and splattering onto the paper. Skulls out! A familiar voice growled. Alice looked to the front and saw Freddy seated at Mrs. Geary's desk, peeling an apple with one of the blades on his right hand. He grinned at Sheila, tossed the apple aside, and stood. No! Alice cried, turning to get out of her seat, but a rusty metal bar slammed into place across her lap, trapping her behind the small desk as Freddy walked toward Sheila. No! Help! Somebody help! Alice looked around, but the other students were obliviously involved in their test. Freddy stood before Sheila, who was trembling like a kitten, and said, All work and no play makes Sheila! A very dull girl! He leaned forward, plucked her glasses off, and flicked his tongue inches from her mouth, and then asked her, Wanna suck face? Sheila screamed as Freddy grabbed her collar, pulled her out of her seat, and pressed his mouth over hers, silencing her cries. 
Alice shouted frantically for help but got no response, while Freddy's scarred cheeks pulled inward as he began to suck, and Sheila's eyes widened impossibly and bulged from their sockets, threatening to pop out as veins began to stand out on her forehead and neck, and her face and hands began to shrivel in her struggle to weaken as her skull seemed to deflate with the soft, moist sound, and her ribcage pressed hard against her shirt, imploded with the horrible crack. Somebody, please, help, Alice said, but quietly this time because she knew Sheila was lost. The girl's bulbous eyes dropped out of their sockets and dangled by bloody cords as her skin shriveled to a leathery husk, and Freddy slammed her down into her desk and laughed. You flock! Hey, Alice! She was right! She was dead on her feet! And now, she's dead in her seat! Then he turned to Alice, reached out and stroked her cheek carefully with one of his blades as he whispered, almost lovingly, Thank you! And Freddy was suddenly gone and the classroom was alive with panic as Sheila lay across the top of her desk clutching her breast and gasping desperately for air. Quickly, Alice got up, fumbled the inhaler from Sheila's book bag, and tried to force it into Sheila's writhing mouth. But Sheila's gasps stopped, her head dropped to the side, and her body became limp in the desk. The room was silent. Alice stood straight and looked around at the shocked students. "'Call an ambulance!' somebody said, as Debbie, Dan, and Rick gathered around Alice. Alice spotted the bug-killing device Sheila had made for Debbie. It had fallen out of Sheila's book bag. She bent down and picked it up. Didn't you see him? Alice asked tremulously. He was here. He did this. I saw him. Rick took her arm and gently coaxed her out of the room as Alice rambled on and on. He did this. I watched it. I, I, I saw it. After all the students had been dismissed for the day, Rick, Alice, Debbie, and Dan stood in front of the school as the ambulance drove slowly out of the parking lot, carrying Sheila's corpse. Rick tried unsuccessfully to calm Alice, but he no longer snapped at her like before. Instead, he found himself trying to ignore her talk about Freddy. It was no longer annoying. It was downright scary. Asthma attack my ass, Debbie mumbled, fighting tears. What? What, come on, what 17-year-old has a fatal asthma attack? I told you, Alice insisted, it was Freddy. Enough of that crap, Debbie snapped. I saw it, I told you, it was my dream, I, I, I brought Sheila in. She turned to Rick slowly, her face darkening with the horrible realization. Oh God, I brought her into my dream, like Kristen did with me. I gave her to Freddy, and now she's dead, she hissed, backing away. Sobbing, she turned and ran away from them. Rick's insides ached as he heard his sister cry. Rick, Dan said, I think Kristen's story is getting to your sister. In a flash of anger, Rick barked, Look, Dan, I'm not so sure it's a story anymore, okay? You mean, you believe it? Well, look at us. We're dropping like flies around here. Rick looked at Debbie and could see in her eyes the same fear he felt. Then he turned and ran after Alice. That night, Alice sat down at her vanity and took from the mirror a picture of herself and Sheila, both laughing and happy. Looking up at the mirror, she saw that still more of her reflection had been exposed by removing the picture. She touched her face in disbelief. She looked prettier, stronger. Chapter 8 A few nights after Sheila's funeral, Dan entered the Craven Inn and saw Alice behind the register. 
he'd come to pick up his call-in order to take the drive-in. Brenda McCarsky, captain of the cheerleader team, was waiting for him in his pickup. She could wait. Hey, um, so Alice, how you doing? He asked, and she smiled wearily. Haven't uh, seen you around lately. I've been working devil shifts. Extra money, huh? You know why, Dan. You just don't believe me. No offense, Alice, really. It's just kind of hard to swallow. The story is, but you can't argue with four deaths. Tears welled up in her eyes. I don't know what to do. I can't stop it. Why doesn't he just kill me? On impulse, Dan reached over the counter and took her hand. How long have you been awake? Three days. In spite of the fact, she looked well-rested and strong. Very pretty, in fact. Not as plain as before. Something about her was different. Don't you understand? She whispered. Every time I sleep, someone might die. All right, Alice. Let's assume this whole thing is true. Why is Freddy all of a sudden after you? She chewed her lower lip for a moment and then said, Kristen was the last child left of the people who killed Freddy. Maybe Freddy can't get to new kids without someone like me. Someone to bring them to him. Like me. The bell over the door clanged and Brenda stuck her head in and called. Danny, we're going to be late for the drive-in. He rolled his eyes. Be right there. Alice got his order for him and, as he paid, Dan said, Look, if there's anything I can do... Thanks she said, smiling. Dan suddenly lost interest in his date with Brenda McCarsky, but he turned and left anyway. The next day, as everyone else suited up for practice in the locker room, Rick went to a stall, locked the door, and sat on the toilet. He needed to be alone for a moment. The deaths had created a lot of tension. Just moments before, Dan had nearly beaten up Buddy Milton for saying Alice was a basket case. But Rick had the added pressure of staying up every night with Alice. He didn't know how she managed to do it. He was ready to collapse. He put his head in his hands, elbows on his knees, and relaxed. Well, tried to relax. Just for a minute or two, he thought. But two minutes became five and ten. And Rick began to doze as Alice struggled to stay awake in Miss Kapitsky's history class. The aging woman lectured in her dry, monotone voice, and Alice's head dropped forward heavily. Her eyes closed as she rested her head on her desktop. Just for a little while, she thought. But when she was jarred from her rest, Alice realized she was in a darkened locker room facing a row of stalls. Half a dozen uniformed cheerleaders hurried into the room, waving their pom-poms and giggling. But Alice was certain it wasn't the girls' locker room. The cheerleaders went to the stall on the end and opened the door, crowding inside. Moving forward, Alice peered into the stall and saw Rick sitting on the toilet with a startled look on his face. She was relieved to see him and pushed her way into the crowded stall. Rick, she said. What's happening, Rick? Why are we... The stall door slammed shut and the entire stall rumbled and jerked like 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 an elevator. Soft, syrupy music began to play from overhead, an elevator music version of taps. They were in an elevator. The giggling cheerleaders seemed not to notice. They lavished Rick with kisses, fondling and stroking him until the elevator jerked to a halt and the door slid open. Alice moved toward Rick, but the cheerleaders headed out of the elevator, pushing her back with them. No! she shouted, fighting them unsuccessfully. No! Rick! Rick! Once she was outside the elevator, the door slid shut with an ominous rumble, and she threw herself onto it, prying at it with her fingers, heaving and pulling, until the door slid open and Rick smiled at her, stepped toward her. But the floor trembled and cracked and collapsed beneath him its pieces falling silently down a black bottomless shaft as Rick grabbed the railing on the wall and dangled over the pit, his legs kicking as he made small panicky sounds in his throat. Rick! Alice screamed, reaching for him. Going down! A voice said from above, and Kristen looked up to see Freddy grinning at them through the elevator's gridless vent. 
chainsaws, lingerie, butcher knives, and infinity! <laughs> Freddy threw back his head and laughed uproariously as the railing began to glow a soft red and Rick's hands began to smoke. As the railing grew rapidly hotter, Rick's palms sizzled and gave off a sickly smell and he screamed, Alice, help me, help me, please God, Alice, Alice, help me. His hands let go and he disappeared into the blackness, his voice fading with him. Alice screamed and looked up at Freddy, who waved to her with his knives. Thank you, he whispered again. As Alice awoke at her desk with a jolt, startling her classmates and Miss Kapitsky. When she realized what had just happened, Alice pounded the desk with her fist and screamed. No! She dashed from the room, ran down the hall and across campus to the gymnasium then into the boys' locker room. Coach Williamson ran toward her, shouting, Hey, young lady, what, what do you think you're... She dodged, ran around him, and found the stalls, opening the one on the end. Rick lay limp, sprawled face down over the toilet. Alice dropped to her knees and released a long, ragged, agonizing scream. Chapter 9 Squinting in the glare of the sun, Alice stared at her brother's casket as the minister droned monotonously. A large crowd was gathered around the gravesite, mostly teenagers. Sniffles and an occasional sob broke the cemetery's stillness. Alice felt a disturbing numbness. She saw no end to the deaths, and her mind seemed to be blocking off any more tears or pain. She stared at the casket, stared and stared and and the lid swung open and Rick sat up smiling. This is great, huh? He laughed. They think I'm dead. I love it. He got out of the casket and walked over to her, touching her cheek. Hey, you know I wouldn't leave you all alone, Alice. This was just a full old Freddy. A tear in her eye, Alice shook her head and whispered, No, no more daydreams. What are we going to do, Alice? Debbie's voice startled her from the daydream. The minister had finished and the crowd was breaking up. It seemed odd to see Debbie crying. She was so tough. We're going to stop daydreaming, Alice said, and take that son of a bitch out. What? God, Alice, what are you talking about? I'm sick of this shit. Who's next, huh? Can you tell me that? Alice took her arm and led her away from the open grave. Dan followed them. You'll be next if you don't get a grip on yourself. Understand? You're going to have to do more than bench presses this time. We have to get smart. Smarter than Freddy. We're going to get him. Debbie seemed to calm down. She even seemed to be taking Alice seriously. Let me help, Dan said. I'm not saying I don't believe you. But, well, well maybe, maybe we should get help from someone else. Oh, sure, Debbie snapped. Let's trade death by Freddy for life in a rubber room. She's right, Alice agreed. Other people, especially adults, won't see it. Well, it couldn't hurt, Dan tried again. Debbie then said, Look, it would be a waste of time. We should start thinking about how we're going to kick Freddy's ass. That's right, Alice examined. And remember, mind over matter. Alice heard her father calling for her and backed away from her friends. Look, I'll see you guys later, okay? She headed across the cemetery toward her father. He was already drunk. Dan watched her go. Mind over matter, Debbie said quietly. Sheila said that to me once. I don't get it. Every day it's like Alice is someone different. No, Dan whispered. It's after every death. Do you really want to tell someone, Dan? About Freddy, I mean? Yeah. And I know just the guy. The next day, Dan and Debbie went to see Mr. Bryson, their English literature teacher. Dan knew that Bryson taught a college night class in mythology and had a background in philosophy. 
Even better, he was a veteran of the 60s, and as Dan and Debbie stood in Bryson's office, Dan noticed a couple of Woodstock posters on the wall. They'd been talking with him for about ten minutes, asking questions about dreams, and now Bryson sat at his desk stroking his chin thoughtfully. Eh, uh, well, Bryson said, every society dating back to the ancients has had theories regarding dreams, what they mean, how to control them. Control them? Yes. Aristotle believed that during sleep your soul roams free. What it sees are dreams. Skilled dreamers control what they see. Where do the souls go? There's supposed to be two gates your soul can enter. One on a positive dream gate, the other a negative. The dream master guards the positive gate, protects its sleeping host. Is there a guard for the negative gate? Debbie asked. There were never any theories about that. Dan hesitated a moment and then said, What if we told you about a guy, a, a demon who lived in dreams and could kill you in your sleep? Bryson raised his eyebrows curiously. Ah, yup, yeah, sounds a bit radical, but yes, it could fit the theory. Great, Dan said enthusiastically, because it's true. There is a guy. His name's Freddy, Debbie added. Bryson looked at them suspiciously. Freddy! Yeah, Dan said, becoming animated. He lives in your dreams and kills you. Now, how do we stop it? Bryson stood, holding up his hands. Whoa, whoa, now slow down, wait a minute. Hey, Aristotle was writing fiction, okay? I mean, none of this is real. Debbie glared at him, getting angry. So what are you saying, that we're full of it? No, not at all, just, well, there have been a lot of deaths around here lately, and I know how stress can get to you children. Tell you what, he removed a business card from his pocket and offered it to Debbie. This is a guy who raps to young people, really understands them. Why don't you give him a try? Debbie slapped the card out of Bryson's hand and spat. Save it! Save all your bullshit! She turned to Dan. Alice was right, let's go! Bryson followed them into the hall, calling. No, wait, you should see this guy. Tell him about Freddy. And remember, you guys just say no. Alice was waiting for them at the foot of the hall stairs. Satisfied? she asked. I knew it would be a waste of time, Debbie grumbled. Dan was disappointed. He shook his head and said, I don't get it. He's from the 60s. I thought those people believed anything. Look. Alice said. We have to keep thinking. Use our heads and stay sharp. Starting tonight, we sleep in shifts. Sooner or later, we're going to conk out, Dan warned. No, we're not, Alice snapped. We're going to get ready. We're going to get ready for Freddy. Debbie unclasped a wicked blank leather bracelet with silver studs from her wrist and handed it to Alice. A bad luck charm, she smirked brings bad luck to the creep you flatten with it. Alice smiled gracefully and then turned to Dan. He felt like a failure. He'd been so sure Bryson would help. But when Alice took his hand, he knew it didn't matter. They would help each other. That night, Alice got Rick's nunchucks and Oriental-style bandana from the garage and took them to her room, where she hung the bandana beside the mirror above Sheila's bug-killing gadget. She put Debbie's studded bracelet on the vanity table, then spotted the picture of herself and Rick on the mirror. She pulled it off the glass, studied it a moment, and then looked at her reflection in the mirror. She could see more of herself, and she had changed even more. She thought she was quite attractive now. There was a new surety and strength in her eyes. Alice took the nunchucks to the middle of the room and tried some of the moves she'd seen Rick go through in the garage. She was slow and clumsy at first, but in mere minutes her arms began to move rapidly, and the nunchuck sliced the air with a whining hum, whipping around her, slapping from one hand to another, the chain clinking and clicking. She stopped suddenly, realizing that what she'd just done was better than anything she'd ever seen Rick do, and he practiced. Alice turned to her reflection again and whispered, "'What's happening to me?'
Chapter 10 Dan had been pacing in front of the Craven Inn for 45 minutes waiting for Alice. That afternoon they had agreed to meet there, but she had not shown up and the Craven Inn had already closed. He looked up and down the dark, deserted street as he walked to his truck. The small, friendly town his family had moved to only months ago now seemed sinister and threatening. He got into his truck and sat behind the wheel. All the towns in America, he muttered. I had to move to the Bermuda Triangle. He folded his arms with a sigh and leaned his head against the back window. He felt sleepy. Alice slammed her bedroom door, stomped to her bed, and sat on the edge. She couldn't meet with Dan because her father wouldn't let her leave the house. I lost Rick because I didn't watch him, he'd slurred, standing in front of the door. I don't want to lose you, honey. We're all we have. She laid back on her bed, her muscles aching from lack of sleep, and closed her eyes. Just for a few minutes, she thought, relaxing until... She snapped awake, thinking, Rick's bedroom window. She hurried down the hall to Rick's room, opened the window, and crawled out, shimmying down the tree. Once on the ground, she headed down the street toward town. In a few minutes, she was standing in front of the Craven Inn, but Dan was nowhere to be found. She searched the intersecting streets for his truck, but it wasn't there. A couple blocks down one of the streets, however, she saw a movie theater. The marquee read Midnight Show, Reefer Madness. Not wanting to go home to her drunken father, Alice walked to the theater, paid admission at the box office, bought some popcorn and a Pepsi at the refreshment stand, and went into the auditorium and found a seat. The black and white images on the screen cast a gray glow onto the blank faces in the audience as they stared at the movie, chewing their popcorn and milk duds. On the screen, a man was playing the piano and laughing maniacally, as a man and woman looked on. Alice watched, trying to get into the film as she ate her popcorn, when suddenly the colorless picture changed to a filthy, run-down urban street. A howling wind blew crumpled newspapers down the sidewalk in front of a dilapidated building, with a sign over the door that read the Crave Inn. Alice's hand froze halfway to her mouth, and she gaped at the screen. It was the diner in which she worked, but much older and in much worse shape, as if she were looking at the Craven Inn 20 or 30 years in the future. A dry, chill wind began to blow through the theater, as if the screen had opened up and the wind in the movie was blowing through the auditorium. On screen, the wind grew stronger, pounding the already battered diner, howling around the theater in a swirl until Alice's carton of popcorn flew from her hand and scattered everywhere, and her hair slapped her face as it was blown around, and then the wind seemed to change direction, blowing back into the screen as it grew more forceful until the screen was sucking air out of the auditorium, like a gigantic vacuum cleaner. The suction was strong enough to slurp Alice's Pepsi out of its cup and into the screen strong enough to rip the front row seats from their bolts and down the black and white street in the film. And the wind grew stronger still until Alice screamed as she was sucked from her seat and threw the air straight into the screen, where she tumbled painlessly onto the sidewalk. Gasping for air, she stood up and looked around. Her surroundings were black and white, completely without color, just as they'd been in the movie. The wind continued to whip around her. She opened the door beneath the Crave Inn's faded broken sign and walked into the diner, where color was immediately restored. Turning to close the door, she looked outside to see the audience on the other side of the screen, oblivious to everything that had happened. They crunched popcorn and sucked soft drinks through straws, watching her intently. And seated in the fifth row, she saw herself head slumped to one side as she slept. No, she whimpered. Wake up! Wake up! The door slammed shut with a bang. Freddy stood behind it, grinning. Alice screamed and stumbled backward, flopping into a counter seat, where the waitress droned. What'll it be, sweetie? It was her, Alice, fat and old, 
with gray hair, wrinkled, pasty skin, and empty eyes. Alice stared at herself, her future self, in horror. Well, what'll it be? The waitress asked impatiently. I don't want to be here forever, you know. The usual, Freddy said, taking the seat beside Alice. He turned to her, and she could smell his foul breath as he said, If the food don't kill you, the service will! The waitress slapped a large pizza onto the counter and shuffled away. But it was no ordinary pizza. What looked at first like meatballs were actually marble-sized heads with vivid faces. They were the faces of Freddy's victims, Kincaid and Joey, Kristen, Sheila and Rick, and many others, all writhing in the melted cheese and screaming up at Alice in tiny insect-like voices. Mmm, my favorite! Freddy hissed, lifting the pizza from the counter. Cheese and carnage pizza! He pointed a deadly blade at the pizza and began to chant, Eeny, meeny, miny, mo! Alice screamed, Rick! when she saw that the blade pointed at a tiny version of her brother's head. Alice! Rick cried, Free us, Alice! Free us! Freddy stabbed the blade into Rick's forehead and plucked him from the mass of melted cheese, holding the head up before him. Mm -mm -mm. I just love soul food. Then he popped the head into his mouth and bit down with a wet, sickening crunch, chewing enthusiastically. No, Alice sobbed. N no, no. Yes, Freddy hissed, holding her face in his hands. More, Alice. Bring me more. He spun around suddenly and the diner's door flew open again. Now, instead of the theater audience, there was a room on the other side. It was a room Alice recognized. She'd been there before. It was Debbie's attic, filled with exercise equipment. Debbie lay on her weight bench, her arms dangled at her sides as she sighed wearily and closed her eyes. Freddie leaned toward Alice's ear and whispered, She's getting sleepy! No! Alice whimpered. Please don't hurt her no more. Please stop. Freddy sneered. Your shift is over. He clanged his blades together and... Alice sat up in bed and looked around her darkened bedroom, cursing herself for falling asleep. She hopped out of bed, praying that Dan was still waiting for her. Meanwhile, Dan snapped his head upright and looked around behind the wheel of his truck. Fell asleep, I guess, he muttered. He spotted Alice hurrying around the corner in front of the Craven Inn and got out of the truck, sensing her urgency. Come on, she shouted. We have to hurry. I'm driving. They got in the truck and Alice burnt rubber as they tore down the street. Debbie jerked awake on her weight bench and grumbled about falling asleep. She'd been waiting for Alice and Dan, working out to pass the time and keep herself awake, but it hadn't worked. Taking a deep breath, she reached up and lifted the barbell with a heave, but two horribly scarred hands closed over the barbell and pushed back down. Debbie looked up to see a hideous man in a floppy hat. His face badly burned, his right hand in a glove of bloodstained knives. She knew immediately that he was Freddy Krueger and tried to push back the fear in her gut. I don't believe in you, she grunted, trying to resist him. That's okay, he laughed. I believe in you. He pushed down harder and harder until her elbows snapped with a horrible crunch and bone cut through flesh, making her scream. No pain, no gain!
Driving like a lunatic, Alice exclaimed. He's going after Debbie. I've got to stop him. You mean we've got to stop him, Dan said. I'm with you. You just feel sorry for me. Cut that shit out. Maybe before, but now I want to help you. Here we are, Alice said, turning into Debbie's driveway. As Debbie forced herself to her feet, her broken arms dangled at her sides uselessly until her forearms broke off and thumped the floor. Black, insect-like claws slid from the stumps of her arms and burst from her shoulders, growing longer and longer until she realized what they were. Cockroach legs, black and crusty and spiny, and Debbie screamed, Give me back my body! Dan jerked awake in his truck and spotted Alice running around the corner in front of the Craven Inn. Confused, he got out of the truck as Alice shouted, We have to hurry, I'm driving! She got in the truck and they screeched away from the curb. Debbie's body was literally falling apart. Pieces were dropping off. Skin was peeling and flaking to reveal the insectile body beneath. She staggered across the attic toward a small door that seemed to grow larger and larger as she got closer, with roach legs ripping through her workout suit, tearing her skin and replacing her legs and joints. She threw herself through the door, but her feet stuck to the floor and she fell forward. The floor was made of a thick goo, like the world's strongest glue. Her face plopped into the substance, cutting off her breath, and she pulled her head back, fighting the sticky substance until the skin peeled from her face, and she sensed the antennae that popped up from her head when she lost her skin, twitching this way and that as she looked around. She didn't want to see her face now, never again. He's going after Debbie, Alice said as she squilled around corners. I've got to stop him. You mean we've got to stop? Dan stopped and looked around, blinked several times. Wait a second. I got the weirdest feeling we've been through this before. Alice threw him a puzzled, confused look. Then it began to dawn on her. Oh my God, we're asleep. He's got us going in circles. She stepped on the accelerator. We've got to keep going. A few feet away from her, Debbie saw another roach struggling in the sticky substance, and she tried to scream, but it came out as a clicking, insect-like sound. Fighting the hold of the goo, she turned toward the door, spotting other roaches trapped in the thick slime. The door had become huge now, almost like a garage door. She struggled toward it, fighting, pulling herself along until an enormous godlike eye appeared in the doorway. Debbie inched forward, looked over the edge to the outside, and saw that she was inside a tiny box held in Freddy's hand. Welcome to the Roach Hotel, he laughed. You can check in, but you can't check out. The walls began to crumble in around her, closing in faster and faster, until there was only blackness. Dan watched Alice as she maneuvered his truck through a suburban labyrinth, and suddenly she stiffened and her head jerked back with a horrible shudder as she cried out. What was that? Dan asked. Debbie, she said, barely a whisper. She's gone. I've collected her like the others. Her eyes widened, and Dan looked out the front window to see Freddy standing in the middle of the road. He knew it was Freddy, even though Dan had never seen him before. It had to be, and Dan shouted as Alice slammed her foot to the floor, shouting, Okay, asleep or awake, I'm gonna punch his fucking ticket! And the truck plunged forward, and Freddy grinned and waved at them, growing larger and larger in the windshield until the truck slammed into him, and there was the teeth-grinding sound of crunching metal, and then nothing. Alice was jarred from sleep by the impact and immediately pried open the truck's mangled door. Dan lay still, embracing the dashboard, his head pressed against the shattered steering wheel. The front end of the truck was hugging the fat trunk of a tree. Oh, g God, Alice stammered. Sleepwalking, we were, we were sleepwalking, that son of a bitch, he made us drive in our sleep. Oh, Dan, I'm sorry, God, I'm so sorry. She looked around to see that there was a car parked across the street, 
and an elderly couple was watching them. The man crossed the street, saying, An ambulance is coming! The ambulance arrived minutes later, and after bandaging Dan's leg with gauze, they put him, moaning in pain, on a stretcher and lifted him inside. Alice got in, too, and knelt beside him. As the ambulance drove away, sirens wailing, one of the paramedics, a chubby, cocky man who seemed oblivious to the urgency of the situation, began filling the syringe with the clear fluid, checking it for air bubbles. What's that do? Alice asked. Uh, rel relaxes your boyfriend, the paramedic replied, preparing to inject the needle into Dan's arm. Alice slapped the syringe away from the paramedic's hand, crying. No, he stays awake. Hey, the paramedic slurred sarcastically, picking up the syringe. Orders is orders. He's allergic, okay? Well, you should have said something in the first place. Damn kids. Alice leaned close and stroked Dan's cheek. Don't let them put you to sleep. Chapter 11 Later, in the emergency room, Alice stood across the room and watched as a nurse and an intern tried to inject Dan with the sedative. He was weak, but managed to make their task difficult. The doctor, Dan's parents, and Alice's father burst in suddenly. When are you going to operate? Alice asked the doctor tremulously. Well, from the looks of him, probably in about 15 minutes. Oh, God, Alice whispered, looking at the clock on the wall. A quarter to ten. After one more look at Dan, she turned to hurry from the room, but her father grabbed her his car keys dangling from his thumb, and held her back. Alice, he slurred, they'll help him. They're going to kill him, she hissed, then snatched the keys from him and dashed toward the door. Alice, damn it, come back here. She ignored him and hurried out the exit, running across the parking lot to his car. By the time she was on the road, driving well over the speed limit, the dashboard clock read 9.49. She had 11 minutes to save Dan, who at that very moment was being wheeled down a corridor on a gurney. He struggled inwardly to fight the slowly growing effects of the shot that he'd received a few minutes before. But the fluorescent lights were growing fuzzier by the moment as they passed slowly and monotonously overhead. He prayed Alice would be able to do something as she screeched to a halt in front of her house, raced from the car to the front door and let herself in, then hurried to the bathroom. Taking a bottle of her father's sleeping pills from the medicine cabinet, she poured several into her palm and said, That ought to be enough for a trip on the Freddy Express, and then chewed them up, then hurried to her room. Standing before her vanity, she swept several of the pictures off the mirror so she could really see herself, then strapped on Debbie's studded bracelet, tucked Sheila's bug-killing gadget under her belt, and lastly tied Rick's oriental bandana around her forearm. Studying her reflection, she said firmly, This ends now. Then she sat down at the vanity, feeling the first effects of the sleeping pills as Dan was lifted onto the operating table, the room being prepared quickly, with nurses checking instruments and doctors scrubbing up. The anesthesiologist appeared beside Dan and smiled down at him, lowering the gas mask slowly over Dan's face. Now you just count backward from a hundred, the man said. No, Dan breathed. Oh, take the pain, please. I have to stay awake. Pl but the mask covered his face and muffled his words. As Alice gasped and lifted her head from the vanity table to stare wide-eyed at her own reflection, she stood quickly amazed by what she saw. It was herself, all right, but she'd changed. She saw in the mirror a turbocharged image of herself, leaner and tighter. Her jeans clung to her thighs, and her shirt was tied halter-like, just above her waist. The bracelet had spikes where there were once rounded studs, and the gadget beneath her belt now glowed, as if emitting a powerful energy. Fucking A, she whispered as... Dan opened his eyes on the operating table and looked up to see a surgical mask doctor bending over him. But the eyes above the light green mask 
The eyes were Freddy's. Kruger, Dan shouted. Well, it ain't Dr. Seuss, Freddy said with an evil laugh. Dan screamed for Alice. Alice heard as the mirror shimmered like a pool, and Alice saw Freddy standing beside Dan, who lay helpless on the table. She took three steps back from the vanity, screamed, Get away from him, you son of a bitch! and ran forward, leaving the floor and shattering the mirror with a dead-on kick as she passed through the mirror and rolled over the operating room floor. Once she was on her feet, Freddy was gone. She went to the operating table and took Dan's hand. Come on, she said urgently. We're dreaming. You can get up now. He gaped at her as he stood, saying, Alice, you look great. Save it for later. Come on. We've got to get out of here. She led him to the swinging doors, pushed through them, and they found themselves in a long, dark tunnel with squiggly, worm-like neon lights on the curved walls. It was a funhouse tunnel the kind that turned slowly as you walked through it. Alice felt Dan squeeze her hand as they started down the tunnel, walking cautiously until Freddy appeared at the other end. He laughed and growled, Out for a lover's stroll! Then he leaned forward, gripped the edge of the tunnel, and turned it until it was spinning wildly, tossing Alice and Dan head over heels. They fought it, turning to crawl back toward the other end where... The operating room door had been replaced by a round stained glass window, which grew larger as they drew near it, until they crashed through the stained glass and tumbled to the floor of an enormous drafty church. Alice rolled over and knelt beside Dan, who looked dazed and weakened. She heard a sound, a disturbing sound, beeping, the beeping of the operating room heart monitor. Alice, Dan croaked as he began to fade, becoming more and more transparent. Dan, she cried. No, you can't. It's too late, Alice. It's too late. He grew dimmer and dimmer until he opened his eyes on the operating table and stared blearily at the faces of doctors and nurses. No, he shouted. Put me back under. I've got to go back. Relax, son, the doctor said soothingly. It was rough, but we pulled you through. No, no, Dan groaned as Alice stood and looked around the church cautiously. Soft voices began to sing from above, and Alice looked up to see several pale children, the emaciated children with bloated stomachs from the paintings in Freddy's living room, standing in the choir loft singing. A loud creak from behind made her turn as the 15-foot-tall double door swung open to reveal Freddy standing in the doorway. He clanked his blades together and his voice echoed through the church as he called. Welcome to Wonderland, Alice! Alice smiled, filling her strength, her energy, and shouted, I'm gonna send your guts back to hell! Bracing herself, she ran down the center aisle of the church and flew into a cartwheel, aiming herself straight at Kruger until her feet landed square in the middle of his chest, sending him backward. But he only laughed. She spun like a top, kicking with each turn, smacking her heel into Freddy's chin again and again and again. But Freddy only threw his head and roared with laughter, enjoying the fight. He moved forward suddenly wrapped an arm around her neck and whispered in her ear, You think you've got what it takes? I've been guarding my gate a long time, bitch! Sweeping her up in his arms, he threw her across the church and Alice slammed into the confessional, shattering it into jagged chunks of wood as Freddy shouted, You have their power, but I have their souls! Unharmed, she lay still a few moments, playing possum as she listened to Freddy's footsteps crunch through the rubble toward her 
until he was close enough, and then she jumped to her feet, swung her fist through the wall where the confessional had been, and closed her fingers around a fat electrical cable, ripping it out of the hole until it snapped in two with the shower of sparks. She snatched the gadget Sheila had made from beneath her belt and slammed the crackling end of the cable into the center of the device, and a glowing blue bolt of electricity shot from it, leaping across the gap between Alice and Freddy, and blasting him in the chest. Freddy released a gut-wrenching scream, and then stood still a moment looking down at his chest with amazement. Alice had blown a hole in the child killer. She could see straight through his chest to the pews behind him. She could even see his heart beating. Maggots squirmed from the thumping organ, and glistening black roaches skittered around the gory edge of the hole. Alice tossed her weapons aside and smiled until Freddy laughed and passed a hand over the hole in his chest casually. It disappeared. He was whole again. He grinned, moving toward her ominously. I am eternal, he said, smacking her across the face and then grabbing her, lifting her over his head and throwing her into the altar. She landed with a crash and looked up to see him advancing on her. She knew it was for the last time. His blades were poised, ready to cut. The children in the choir loft began to chant. Now I lay me down to sleep, the master of dreams my soul to keep, for in the reflections of mine's eye... The remaining words suddenly came to Alice as if she'd known them all along, and she recited them with the children at the same time sweeping a shiny reflective shard of stained glass from the littered floor. Let evil see itself and it shall die! She held up the mirror-like glass and it shined on Freddy's face as he gazed at his own reflection and he staggered backward, his mouth yawning open to scream. But the voice that screamed was not his. It was the combined voices of his young, innocent victims crying out in relief. He stumbled back against the wall as his red and green striped shirt began to pulse as something beneath it moved, small young arms reaching out of Freddy's chest and stomach, clawing at the shirt's material until they tore through and the hands of Freddy's victims reached up toward his face, one clutching his jaw and pulling down hard while another dug its fingers into his eyes and another closed on his throat while another squeezed his neck, and another his scarred cheek, and Freddy's screams became his own, and his tortured voice bounced through the church relentlessly, as his mouth was pulled open farther and farther until thick, dark blood sprayed from his eye sockets, and the horribly burned skin of his face peeled away like rind, and his jaw tore away with a wet crunch, and a shimmering multicolored stream of light rose from his split skull. The tiny voices of happy children sang from the light, and Alice watched it rise toward the shattered window above as the voices called, Thank you! Thank you, Alice! Goodbye! Goodbye! Freddy imploded and fell to the floor, an empty shell. The church was silent. The children were gone. Alice was alone. She walked slowly toward Freddy's remains looked down at them a moment, and then hissed. Rest in hell! She slammed the huge doors of the church as she left. <laughs> Chapter 12 Weeks later, when Dan was finally able to get out, they went for a long walk through Springwood Park, hand in hand. Both were bruised and cut, but the injuries inside would take much longer to heal than those on the outside. I slept through all of last night, Dan said happily, and I had no guest in my dreams. I'm still having trouble, Alice admitted. I managed two, maybe three hours a night. I don't mind, though. Now I have more reasons to enjoy staying awake. She kissed him gently as they stopped beside a large fountain. Water sprayed into the air and cascaded into the round pool below. Dan fished in his pocket for some change. Oh, come on, Alice laughed. You don't believe in that stuff, do you? Yeah, I do, and... 
I think you do too. Now, make a wish. He tossed the coin in and Alice watched as the water rippled in response. As the pool's surface shimmered, Alice thought she saw for just an instant Freddy's reflection as if he were standing across the fountain grinning at them. It was gone in the blink of an eye. What did you wish for? Dan asked, smiling. She stared at the water a moment longer as goose flesh crawled over her neck and back. Freddy was gone. Standing, she said. If I tell you, then it won't come true. Holding hands, they walked away from the fountain. Together. <laughs> okay, Slashaholics, this has been A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, the novelization of the film by Joseph Locke. I hope you've enjoyed this book. This is technically book number 54 on the channel. I'm still putting out uploads of 52 and 53. Uh, but I did start those before this one. This was just a shorter book. Um, but yeah, so let's talk about this book. Um, very short, but it's not just, it's not like part one and two where it was just exactly the movie but in book form. We got quite a few little differences here and a couple big differences. Uh, the biggest difference is Rick's death. We got the actual death from the script and not what they ended up having to shoot in the movie. You know, that really, really horrible, uh, invisible Freddy kung fu fight scene. Uh, at least we got the real scene from the script with him, you know, on the toilet, falls asleep. It turns into um, an elevator, and he falls to his death. And, you know, that scene is so intense because his sister's there. She's trying to get to him. All the cheerleaders are pushing her out of the elevator. It's just nuts. Um, but let's talk about some of the reasons I like this movie and this novelization and some of the things I don't like. Um, the biggest thing I don't like, which well, I was hoping the book would uh, follow the novelization of Part 3, but it didn't. It followed the movie of Part 3. So anybody who listened to Dream Warrior's novelization, I'm sure this was a bit confusing, but this novelization of Part 4 follows the movie, not the Part 3 novelization that's different than the Part 3 movie. Uh, so that's why it's like that. But I've always hated how easily Kincaid and Joey and Kristen uh, were killed in Dream Master. It's like they went through all that stuff in Dream Warriors just to right, out, right off the bat be killed off by Freddy in Dream Master. And I was hoping the book would give us a little more explanation on how Freddy came back, why Jason the dog peed fire, you know, something. But no, no explanation given. Uh, so that's another tick, you know, off there. Because um, these authors, obviously, they can throw in some creative liberties. They're just choosing not to. You hear those cars in the background, sorry. Um, God, when I'm trying to narrate, it's like every motorcycle in my county will try to drive by while I'm trying to record a narration. Um, but yeah, so the writer didn't take many liberties, but there were a few little differences here and there. And uh, the most confusing one was the Craven Inn, because it already sounded like Craven when you say Crave Inn. Uh, but yeah, so instead of Crave In, it's Craven In. So it's Craven In, Crave In In. Uh, it's weird. Uh, but yeah. Now let's talk about the things I do like about the movie. I do like the kills. They're all pretty creative and fun. I love the whole soul food pizza thing. I'm glad I got to do that scene from the movie. A uh, couple of the lines seemed a little bit different. Um, I noticed that throughout the whole book. Some of the lines were a bit different than they were in the movie. And a few of the things that happened in the scenes were slightly different. In fact, if there's any that you caught uh, in this book at all, please, in the comment section, let's make a list of differences that you guys caught from the movie in this novelization. Uh, that'd be a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, so the kills were, were, were a lot like the movie except for Rick's. Um, I do enjoy how when her friends die, they kind of go into her and help power her up. But then, when we get to Freddy, she uses all that power they gave her, but it doesn't really do nothing to him. He just, you know, wipes away that hole, and he's, 
healed again. It's the mirror thing that finally does him in, the Dream Master uh, uh, nursery rhyme, which uh, I always thought was pretty cool, too. Um, but I, I don't like that after all that sacrifice, that her friends dying, giving her the power, it ultimately doesn't do a thing but buy her a couple extra minutes to figure out the nursery rhyme. That's all that really did. Uh, my favorite kill of the book is the same as the movie, and that would be Debbie's cockroach scene. Such great, in, in the movie, such great special effects for that. And in the book, I really enjoyed uh, how the author wrote it out. It really put me there in the scene. I could just see it, and I, but also I could feel what Debbie was going through. That panic and disgust. Oh, I just can't even imagine it. Um, my biggest gripe about this author, uh, Joseph Locke, if uh, you're listening, I did enjoy the book. I just don't like the whole Alice walked down the hall and then she saw Rick. You know, it's like there's a lot of that, and I have to read it that way because if I if I read it straight together, it doesn't it, it doesn't really work. Um, so if you if you caught on to that while I was reading, it's like God, why is he doing that? It's because that's the way it's written. And that's the way it's supposed to be read. If you were reading it yourself, that is how he's trying to get you to read it. Uh, you know, to kind of it's kind of a cliffhanger till the next sentence. Uh, kind of like R.L. Stein did with chapters, except for uh, uh, this guy does it with sentences and paragraphs and stuff. And to connect one character scene to the next character scene. Uh, which isn't, it's not too bad, it's just overly done in the book. Um, that's, that's, I gotta say that it's overly done. Um, the final showdown with Freddy, fun as always. I love the whole concept of all the souls in his chest and stuff breaking out, the arms coming out, ripping, and they're ripping his face apart, tearing him to shreds. He falls into nothing. Uh, we all know he's going to be back in A Nightmare on Elm Street, The Dream Child, which I will also narrate on the channel very, very soon, actually. Um, there is no uh, novelization for Freddy's Dead, um, but that's okay. Uh, that's the only one there's not a novelization for. So if there's any fans out there that like to write, maybe you could write a, a, a fan-made novelization to Freddy's Dead. Get with me, and I will narrate it here on the channel. Uh, honestly, I will. And if you want to throw in some creative liberties with it, go for it. You know, make it your own. But a novelization of Freddy's Dead would be cool to add to the library here on the channel. Uh, there's a fan, uh, fan-written version of Friday the 13th 4, uh, the final chapter that I'm going to be narrating uh, later on this year or early 2021. That's going to be a lot of fun uh, to see how that turned out. I know they took a few creative liberties, uh, but still you know, made sure to get the basic story in there. So yeah, guys, uh, Alice's first chapter in the Nightmare on Elm Street uh, universe is now complete here on the channel. And it was a pretty, uh, pretty quick audio book uh, as far as getting the chapters out. Uh, I did enjoy it. Uh, I'll give it a rating whenever we uh, discuss it on uh, the Out of Print Slashers podcast. I don't want to give my rating yet. I'm going to think on it in a little while. But yeah, I always enjoyed the scene in the uh, theater, you know, where she gets pulled into the screen, meets her older self. You know, Freddy's kind of casual. <laughs> the usual, you know. Um, I loved her relationship with Rick in the book. We got a lot more detail there, got in their heads a little more. And, uh, you know, that, that sibling uh, love and camaraderie and stuff was really great in the book. And he was really looking out for his sister. And uh, I can just feel the pain she was going through uh, when she lost Rick compared to losing, like, Sheila and Kincaid and Joey and stuff. Um, but, yeah, I enjoyed her scenes with Kristen. You know, I do think that just like the movie, the scene where Kristen gives her her powers is a little too quick. I would have liked to have seen that drawn out a little more, but there was a couple of slight differences in the book compared to the movie on that end. Um, I always loved uh, Sheila's uh, death, you know. Wanna suck face? You flunk, bitch. <laughs> um, Alright, guys, yeah, so this has been A Nightmare on Elm Street for The Dream Master, the novelization by Joseph Locke. Uh, thank you all so much for hanging with me and listening. Uh, I'll be back here very soon with more slasher mayhem in audiobook form. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, thanks for being awesome, be excellent to each other, and pleasant dreams, bitch! I'll see you next time. 
you see.